All right, I want to welcome everybody back to another episode of the Shadows Podcast. I'm your host, Trip Bodenheimer. And on this podcast episode, we're going to hear the story of Dr. Rob Bell. Uh, some of his accolades here to go ahead and get started uh, is he is a sports psychologist or sports psychology coach. His company, DRB and Associates, coach executives and professional athletes and is based in Indianapolis. He's also an author. He's got a, a huge resume that I could spend probably the next hour and a half sitting here reading to you, but we're going to dive deep into that as we go throughout this. But uh, mental toughness, you know, that's something he specializes in. We're going to definitely talk about that someone here as well. But sir, welcome to the Shadows Podcast. Odie, thanks so much for having me, buddy. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you here. And we were just talking before we came on the air. You're in Indianapolis, kind of the hub of the NCAA tournament this year. That's right, man. Yeah, but they, yeah. they do a good job always putting on um, activities, man. So they wouldn't do it if they didn't know they couldn't pull it off. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting. The time we're recording this, it's, you know, getting into conference tournament season. So it'll be interesting to see how everything uh, transpires over the next couple of weeks. But, sir, before we get going with your story, we're going to get started with some rapid fire questions here for you. First one, you get a ticket. You can go on an adventure tomorrow to anywhere. Where would that be? Uh, I mean, I've still, I've never been to French Polynesian islands. So, I mean, that's, that's one of the things that um, I'm still have on my bucket list to do. So I would say that one. Okay. Yeah. What area are you like of your life? Are you never satisfied with? What area of my life am I not satisfied with? Like current life or like my past life? Current life. <laughs> oh man. I mean, so I always think there's this balance of being good enough and then not being good enough. So, you know, that's what I've always seen with the best. And I mean, I, I struggle with that as well. It's just um, how do you be pleased, but never satisfied. So it's that always striving, always wanting to get better, but at the same time being able to reflect and appreciate and have the perspective and gratitude that you need. Um, so it's that balancing act, man, that, that I think is still a struggle. Okay. What is something that you collect? Good one, man. Uh, all right, I do this. I collect uh, snow globes for my kids. So whenever they were born and wherever I was traveling, I was always like, well, you know, you got to get something for your kids. Well, snow globes were something that were pretty inexpensive and it kind of marked where we were, you know, at that time. And so, um, wherever I was, man, I would get like the snow globes, cheap gift. I could always, you know, I didn't have to go out to get it. It was always be there at the airport and then got them. So then my kids got them lined up on their dressers, man. I think they're, you know, boy, they're in the twenties right now for snow globes. That's really man. cool. Yeah. My wife has this uh, magnet collection that we have from, from all the places we, we've been to. Yeah. That's good, man. I think you got to do something small like that to appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. I know people do Starbucks mugs and, and their whole kitchen has to be full at this point. What is something you will avoid at all cost? Something I will avoid at all costs. It's a good one, man. Um, binge watching TV shows. I'll avoid that at all costs. Really? Start, yeah, because if I start it, then I'll, I'll start to binge watch. And I just, it's a whole just, Saturday. Yeah, and I just won't do it. So that's why yeah. I won't watch any. I mean, then I feel bad because I'm not in the pop culture stuff, but like, no, nah, I never watch any, any of those shows. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and now get started with your journey. Uh, if you don't mind, tell us about your childhood growing up. Yeah, man. So I grew up in, uh, in Maryland, a uh, small town, about an hour outside DC and uh, Baltimore and sports was my entire life growing up, man. Played base. I mean, I played every sport, but baseball and soccer were the ones I kind of specialized in. And I uh, grew up in a real small town, hardworking town, but closed-minded, I think, when it came to a lot of people. Um, and – but it was – I I fell in love with sports, I think, to a cerebral level where, like, when Wimbledon would come on every year, I would sit and watch round one – all the way through to when it's finished, man. Like we had, we got HBOs and they were the ones that would show like the first round matches and stuff. And it became that way with like every single sport, man. I was just obsessed with, you know, with greatness and how uh, the best became better. And that's, you know, my, my path got off track really in high school because 
um, man, I just started partying, you know, and didn't really, I mean, it was like, we followed the models of the people around us, you know, and they're the good athletes that were in my school. Well, they partied. So might as well party as well. And if you're going to party, you're going to do something, you know, do something right. And uh, so look, if I wasn't killing it on the baseball field, man, you got to kill it in, at the party scene. And uh, that's where, you know, it started to go off the tracks, man. That followed me into, into college. And um, do you want me to keep going into that college or stop at the childhood piece? Yeah. Well, well, I know, I know where you're going with the college okay. piece before you get to that. What, yeah. uh, tell us about your parents. what did your parents do? Yeah. So my parents, my, my dad was uh, owned his own business. Uh, they got divorced when I was about 10 years old. My mom. Um, so my mom was probably my model when it came to that point, because she, uh, when they kind of got divorced, you know, that schism that happens in a lot of different families that happened in ours. And my mom went back and got her associates. And then she went back and got her uh, bachelor's, got her RN, got her master's degree, ended up becoming vice president of the hospital. And I remember as a kid too, with her, you know, I mean, you couldn't watch, you know, whatever it was, I man, eight or 10 years old. I mean, I had to go to school with her. I remember sitting like in those classes with her sometimes, not all the time, but some of those night classes and um, go figure, man. I stayed in school as well, man. I got a PhD, but it was like, uh, I remember those experiences of, you know, if you want something bad enough, man, you just got to go get it. And there's, there's no other way around it. Um, but they were, uh, you know, they're both still alive, uh, mothers, uh, going through cancer right now. Uh, but chemo is actually going pretty well. And, um, yeah, man, great, great parents, man. I know they, they loved us all. And, um, I never, really you know try to ever take that one for granted so you started you kind of alluded to you know you went off to college uh tell us about when you went to college and what that you know that life-changing moment was for you yeah so when i went to college it was a, a bit small school in west virginia d2 school called shepherd university and i went there thinking that my 85 mile an hour fastball was going to get me to the major leagues you know, that was my myopic viewpoint. And little did I know that, I mean, I didn't even work near as hard as I need to. Um, and, but, you know, I just didn't know. And, but when I got to college, man, it was like, you know, baseball and partying and no accountability. Like, what could go wrong, man? You know, it's like, and uh, whenever I'm speaking to my college athletes, man, I just say, look, nothing good happens after midnight. And it's usually true. And for some reason, we're partying this, this one night and it's near this, uh, near this bridge and this bridge was this cliff and up walking off a 80 foot cliff and I uh, hit once and I'm laying at the bottom of this crevasse. I was conscious during the, the whole time. Um, you know, I had gaping head wound and fractured my arm, fractured my back, you know, but I was alive, man. And, uh, they had to crane me up out of it, take me to the hospital where my mom's a nurse oldest again like i said right oldest of 11 catholic family man no sympathy on me whatsoever this happens on a friday mate i'm back to school on monday now in a lot of pain uh really drugged up i wanted to come home but she said you're going right back to school man you know and so i'm now i'm, I'm on campus now i'm that guy like oh my god that that guy right there that's the guy that fell off that cliff you know school of about five thousand people man it was uh not hard to point me out and baseball at that point then was done. And that caused a lot of pain, man, because it was like, that's kind of all I knew up to that point. And, you know, if I was more talented, I probably would have been able to come back, but I was, you know, just an average player. And, uh, but, you know, I always say in every bad situation, like some good is going to happen out of that. And even though that pain took a while to reconcile, uh, it did light a fire. And then I was, I was blessed enough to actually take that psychology class which when I took that class, that's when it was tattooed in my heart that this is what I want to do with my life, man. I'm going to work on the mind and combine it with sports somehow. And this is what I want to do. And then it was at that time too, that found out about sports psychology and that's a whole nother hinge moment. But, uh, that was, that was the experience, man. That's where that, that hinge moment right there, that was life changing. Speaking of the mind, what was going through your mind? You said you remember everything that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, when you felt like when you when you're you know that moment transpires and and you know you're waiting to get uh, airlifted and everything what's what's going through your head? So and I think like and this is how powerful the mind is and like 
research and when people have traumatic experiences like that, like a car accident or something, and, you know, how the mind actually shuts off and it protects itself. So it doesn't allow you, yeah, you're in pain, but you don't, you're not really experiencing like the pain of if you just broke your arm right now. And so the body kind of self protects itself. And I remember, um, you know, falling off the cliff, I remember hitting and I remember actually even thinking in that, oh my God, I'm falling. And just laying at the bottom there, man, it was, um, uh, it was, you know, shock. Uh, I think that was probably the major, um, you know, feeling at that point. Afterwards, it was extreme shame and disappointment. You know, how could you screw up and how could you mess, mess this up, you know? Um, well, at the same time, people were telling you how you know fortunate you were to be alive, and you felt like you just made the biggest mistake in your life, which you know I did. And um, and I always say this too, man. It was like, look, if it didn't happen there, it would have happened some some time else. You know, the train was going off the tracks, man. It was just that was the culminating factor. But yeah, totally blessed to be alive, man, and, and was saved at that moment. Yeah, your story is pretty similar to someone we just had on the show, Chad Porter, who got in a. Uh, boating accident and he, he's like I remember vividly I never went out of uh, consciousness I was there the whole time remember everything that was happening and um, it's crazy to try to put yourself in their, their position to see what they're going through so you ended up going from Shepherd. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this to University of Tennessee yeah I went to Temple University first for a master's and then went to Tennessee okay all right so you went to Temple then Tennessee what do you remember about those experiences so uh, Lance Armstrong had a quote, right? And that was about mm-hmm. the, uh, the book. Um, you know, it's not about the bike came out. And again, every, everyone read the book. It was a fantastic book. And whatever we think about Lance now, you know, it's, it's fine. But he said a quote. He's like, if you ever get a second chance in life, you got to go all the way. And I always thought that was such a righteous statement, man. And when I got to Temple, I realized I was really given a second shot. And I wasn't going to blow it, man. And that's when um, I read everything I could on sports psychology. Uh, I wasn't going to miss a class, man. I was going to go above and beyond because I knew, again, I mean, even in college, I was smart enough to get by. And yeah, I mean, I had to study and I had to get those habits down, but it was, uh, it was only in grad school, man, that, I mean, it was working out every day, running, but then it became marathons. And that, that was where that discipline piece, man, really took over it because it was, it was a gift and I wasn't going to blow it. I knew that. And there was still, yeah, man, a lot of shame from messing up before, but man, that's when I, I knew what I wanted to do and I was willing to do whatever it took. And that's, that's what I remember about Philadelphia and temple. And, uh, you know, you know, in your early twenties, been in Philly, I mean, it was absolutely great, man. I love that area. And then from there went to the university of Tennessee and still had in my heart, exactly what I wanted to do with my life. And that was work with athletes, coaching the teams on mental toughness and whatever it took to do that. I was willing to do it and didn't know what it kind of looked like, but it ended up being with uh, professional golfers and started working with pro golfers and caddied event for guys. And then, uh, you know, from there, what everybody does in that field of sports psychology is, well, you are a clinical psychologist and then you kind of work with athletes or you become a professor at university and then you work with athletes. So that's what I did. I was, went to, uh, moved up here to Indianapolis and started at the university level, running the sports psych program, uh, building my business up at the same time. And then that was the first time where I just was no longer happy because I wasn't on that path that I knew I was supposed to be going down and was there for about five years. But then it became one of those, another hinge moment, man, where I was like, I'm done. And I'm, I got two kids under the age of five and I left uh, comfortable position, you know, very comfortable. But I left and started my own business, man. And it was that point, man. I just totally never looked back. And then it was another chapter and another level and uh, that, that life took on. And what advice would you have for someone? Because I know a lot of people are probably in similar situations. They have a family that's dependent upon them. They're not happy doing what they, they're currently doing. They want to have some sort of change of pace. What advice would you have to someone in that situation? So that's a great question, man, because, you know, from my perspective, right, I wanted the shot. I mean, I've missed shots, man, but I still want the shot. You know what I mean? If we play ping pong against another one another and, and, and I'm losing 10 times, give me another 11th game, man. You know, let me, let me get better because we're learning robots, right? Like, let me get better at this. And I still want the shot. So I wanted the shot whether I was going to make it or miss it. 
And Gil Reyes, uh, Andre Agassi strength coach once told me this quote. I thought this was righteous too, man. He said, some battles are worth fighting even if you lose. Buddy, I wanted that shot to my business because I knew I was good at what I did. And I wanted to, I wanted to create that path, man, however it looked like. And even if I was going to fall or fail, that was going to be part of it. But I wanted that opportunity. And that was the big part, man. Do you want the opportunity or not? You know, because you can't have safety and, and opportunity at the same time. Those don't coexist in the same space. And then the other part, man, is it was just something I prayed about. You know, no lie, man. I prayed about it. I said, I need a burning bush moment. If this is what I'm supposed to do, I need a sign here that I'm supposed to leave this. Because if not, then, hey, man, I can stay and suck it up, even though I'm unhappy. And uh, it was praying about that, man. I got peace. And um, from that, it was really tough at the beginning, very tough. And what I mean is, is like there would be some months, I, I set this like little base of income that I had to make a month, right? Like, hey, you got to clear I mean, it was something ridiculous, man. Like, you know, if, if 3,000, if you clear 3,000 a month, right, that's going to take care of all the basic expenses and, you know, you're breaking even, right? And that's, and every month, man, it, it always worked out, whether it was a speaking engagement, a new client, it always worked out and I always hit that number. And then obviously the number got bigger, you know, but it was like, it was just kind of proof, man, that it was on that right track and always took care of it, man. And I mean, none of that stuff was me. You know, that was all I think of, of God and being, you know, and having God at the fore center of that, that that's where it took off. I like what you said too, about safety and opportunity and not being able to really coexist. I mean, it's true. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really good stuff there. And you talked about your burning bush moment that you had. Uh, also, I wanted to ask you this, and I'm, I'm sure the timeline is probably going to be a little off, but you also were involved in a car accident that was also... Yeah. When was that? So the car accident was the same year as falling off the cliff. Really? That was just a bad year for you. I mean, believe that, man. I mean, first year in college, dude, you what? know, it's like, and, and it's like, well, you know, you fall off a cliff, man, aren't you going to get it then? And yeah, I got it. But how do you deal with pain? You know, how do you deal with pain and then no longer having your sport? Well, you drink and you use, man. Mm. So it's like, uh, that takes care of the pain. Yeah. And, and it was um, April 20th then of that next year, you know, it was that next year, but that same caliber year, man, that I was in a, a single car drunk driving accident, man. It was, you know, stupid decision. It was absolutely awful. Um, you know, I'm sober today, but it's like what I always say, like takes two by four moments for me, right? Like you got to take a two by four, hit me over the head with it. But it was only through those experiences, man, I was really given the gratitude. And that's why, again, when I got to grad school, I wasn't going to blow it. You know what I mean? I wasn't going to mess up like I had, man, because I knew I was giving another shot. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And you mentioned you spent 10 plus years focusing on mental health training. You worked with various coaches, athletes, teams. You talked about uh, working with uh, golfers. What do you think it was that drew you to golf? Uh, probably more so than anything else. Well, it was a sport, again, that I never played like growing up, mm. you know, and then when I got to Temple University um, for an assistantship, one of the directors asked me, hey, you know, we have this golf class. Could you teach golf? Well, you know, what my answer was, you betcha. Yeah, I can teach golf, golf all the time, man. And you just got to stay one chapter ahead. So it was like golf in there. Um, you know, again, it's inner city Philly. Like there's not a lot of golf courses right there. So it's like on the mats in the, in the gym. Well, there were a couple of golfers on the golf team that were in that class, what they were doing in that class, I have no idea. Well, they were interested in the mental game and I, I need to learn golf. And so we kind of, yeah, man, pick my brain on mental game stuff. And then you helped me with the golf. And then that's where that sort of started to take off. And then when I was at Tennessee, just started working with some local pros and one of the pros qualified for a PJ tour event. And we're at, we're there that week. And he already had a caddy for the event. So I was just kind of his mental coach. Well, we ran into another golfer that did not have a caddy for that week. And I ended up caddying for him. And, you know, from there, that's when uh, another hinge moment, but it, uh, it took off, man. And then that's where just working with golfers. And if you think about it, it's like golf is the sport where, you know, you can't hustle. The hustling just does not help you. And yeah, I mean, your practice habits, but not when you're actually playing. And it is absolutely the most mental game that there is uh, from so, you know, people are going to say, well, it's all mental. It's all mental. And I get it, but it's like, 
you're the only one that has to handle those mistakes and commit to the shot. So there's so many facets and layers of that mental game that golfers are gravitated to it, man. And it was just able to help them out and, and caddy at the same time and took off, man. And again, wasn't anything I picked, man. It kind of picked me. It's a crazy thing about your, your journey that I think intrigues me so much is this, it wasn't, you know, chalk all the way through. It was just all of these different opportunities and, and obstacles that were put in front of you. During that, that, you know, that time you worked with, you know, coaches, athletes, team, what intrinsically, like what was the most rewarding experience you've had? It's still, it's the same thing, man. It's like when they have that fist pump moment, you know, it's when they're so close to reaching that goal, man, and, and they get it. That's the best feeling there is. And I, I, I share this and this is honest truth, man. It's like, it doesn't matter if it's a golf on the PJ tour. Yeah. It's going to pay better, you know, than, than a, somebody at the high school winning state, but the feeling is exactly the same. I get so much more gratitude and appreciation for just somebody reaching that goal and having that breakthrough moment. That is just so special because you can't, you can't buy it, you know, and they don't give it away. You have to earn that moment. And the older I get, I know those moments come and they go, but it's like, I think if we can have those moments, man, it cements in our mind that we can do anything. And those moments are so important. That's the reason why I love sports so much is, and especially, you know, with executive athletes, but with sports, it's, there's no ambiguity, right? You swim the time, you make the time or you don't, you make the shot or you don't, you hit the ball or you don't like in life, man, there's so much more ambiguity in sports. There's not. And that's, that's what always gravitated me to, towards it. But that's the best part, man, is when they have those, those, and I call them those hinge moments for those people, because from that moment on, everything is different. But that's the best feeling, man, without a doubt. It's funny how, especially with sports, you know, when you're younger, you want to be like the starting point guard and you want to be the starting pitcher. But then when you get older, it's all about like other people's success, and, you know, that that is what you remember the most is seeing somebody else uh, get that that achievement. And but you have had some uh, individual success as well. You've been uh, you've competed in full Ironman competitions, uh, Tough Mudder, ultra marathons, numerous other races. Uh, tell us about the mindset that goes into competing in something like an Ironman competition. So it's, uh, so when it came to that, I'm not the best when it comes to like, Hey man, this is the year long plan. Even with the Ironman, it was probably like three months. But the thing is, is I didn't, I'm not a biker, man. I didn't even own a bike, you know? So I had to procure a bike. And I mean, with, with this Ironman, for instance, it's just, look, my skill is never given up. That's, that's the one thing I'm good at, right? Just never given up. So perseverance, persistence, that motivation piece, that's what I'm really good at. And doing whatever it takes. Like when we say do whatever it takes, most people, I think they mean do whatever it takes up to that point of, well, I'm not then willing to do whatever it takes. So getting a bike, borrowing a bike, and I need to learn how to ride. And it's not like, I mean, I knew how to ride. I was an athlete. So that always helped. But I went and I joined a cycling team. That was the biggest part, man. Talk about fear to join a cycling team. Everyone's wearing the same kit. And I'm showing up like in, in regular shorts, not even try shorts, man, regular shorts. And, you know, oh my God, I don't want this guy on my wheel. You know what I mean? And it's like, you got baptism by fire, buddy. You got to get in there and do it. And, you know, it's, you know, no one talks to you and that's okay, man. But that, you know, the beauty about sports is like when you earn your keep, right? Like if you go up to the pickup game, basketball and you play, Hey, if you can play, you can play. And I was an athlete so I could hang. And once they kind of saw I was hanging, I was eager and I wasn't going to quit. and I was going to be there, you know, they accept you. And, you know, then you kind of become part of the team and stuff like that. But it's like, that was the, that was the toughest part, man. And it's like, you know, most people do their training on a trainer. You know, that wasn't going to help me, man. I needed to learn and fast. And really when it just comes to any of those races, um, I don't have the speed that I once did or never really did, but I don't have the speed that I did. So I have to do events that where you never give up is the goal. If you don't give up, will you finish? So hundred miler this year, man. And, uh, you know, who knows what other ultra races come up, but that's, that's the big key. I just like entering things where you never give up, then you'll be successful. How are you in terms of like goal setting? Like when you, when, what is your mindset like in terms of, yeah, I think I'm going to do this. Or you mentioned you're not like much of a planner, but 
how are you in terms of goal setting? So, and I, and I am a, I am a planner when it comes to the day-to-day stuff. Like I'm obsessive about my plan from day to day, but what I think is, is you have to have a vision about where it is that you want to go, what it is that looks like, what it feels like. You got to manifest that vision. And then from there, you got to leave that vision where it is. And then, man, what do I need to do this week to help me get there? And you got to break it down. And what is it that I need to do today? And does it help me get to where I want to go? And that's as simple as it is, man. I'm not a big goal setter when it comes to, because I'm not a big goal setter when it comes to outcome goals, because people set outcome goals and they just kind of sit there. That's where I like, man, you got to have a vision. You got to have something that's going to drive you where you don't need to have the motivation every day because the habits are being built. You know, imagine if Martin Luther King said, I have a goal. He didn't say I have a goal, man. He said, I have a dream. You know, I don't have a mission statement. I have a dream. And when you have that, everything else falls into place. And so then I'm about, well, what's the process that we need to do in order to get there? And that's where I'm about, man, the processes and habits that we kind of create. And that, that's how it works for me. And that's how I try to, you know, focus people on. Well, you definitely made the most with your time that you've been given, because another thing that you have done that I think is amazing is you haven't just written a book, you've written seven books and, you know, they're built around mental toughness. I see behind you, uh, you got some of the, the giant blow ups of them. Uh, tell everyone about what goes into putting together a book and then much less how in the world you produce seven of them. Yeah, man. Um, I wasn't a good writer at all in high school, right? A B student in high school, never studied a day. Get to college, now I got to study just to hang with the Bs. And when I get to grad school, you, now you can't fake it. Now you just can't fake that stuff. You have to write a thesis and it has to be perfect. I mean, perfect, right? Where you, and, and you get it, the feedback, man. So I ended up only by writing my thesis did I then sort of discover the path on how to write. And that's totally different academic writing from like regular writing. But the way that it was put together, and it was Dan Check that taught me this. What Dan Check taught me was you write for one hour every day. And it's like, look, if we structure everything as in a workout, I can do that, man. I can write for one hour a day, right? Well, I can work out for one hour a day. That's not a problem. I can go for a one hour run. And when we structure it like that, it becomes manageable pieces, right? The process. And so every single book that I've ever written, one hour every day, you sit there and there's, it, it averages out to about, you know, five days a week. I mean, because stuff kind of gets in there. Sometimes there's got to be a 20 mile run in the morning, but it's first thing in the morning, man, you sit there and you write for one hour. And that's how John Grisham wrote all of his books, you know, before you go in there. So if you write before the day gets started, the thoughts then start to come together and the patterns start to come together. Now, the part that I thought would get better is I thought it'd be an easier process, but it's not. Every book that I write, man, is actually gets harder because I don't want to repeat the damn thing I said and no one gets there alone as in the hinge or in them puke and rally. You got to have the different points because I hate it if I read a book and it's like, dude, you already said this in your other book. I mean, that turns me off because I'm like, where's the originality into it? And it's like, imagine like, Seriously, if you're an artist and you're a musician and you're going to put this song on the, on the new album as well, it, it just wouldn't sell, buddy. You know, it just doesn't work. So you got to come up with the new stuff. And it's, that's the best way that I've found to be able to do it, man. It's like um, the reason why I do a lot of these races too and experiences is for fodder for the next book, man, because experience is the best teacher and the best teacher, man, it allows us then, man, where's the lesson in this that I can share with others that are going to be able to help them through it. That's really good advice there too. Cause I've, I've, you know, gotten this habit of waking up and doing all my reading and everything that I want to be most productive at, I get done first thing in the morning before my mind starts getting bogged with 10,000 other things. Uh, now talk about puke and rally. It's not about the setback. It's about the comeback. Um, that's your latest one. Fill people in on that who've never heard of that book. Yeah, man. Well, it's it's a bit of a cheeky title, but it's it's apropos, man. The reason why is, um, look, we've all puked, right? Every single one of us has puked. And it's actually a gift that we can puke, if whether you believe it or not. I hate throwing up, man. Like, I can't stand it, you know? But, like, there's animals that can't puke. You know why rat poison is so effective? Because they can't throw up. They lack the ability to throw up. That's why rat poison works. And so it's... And if we think about every time that we puke, man, we feel better. 
And so the puke, these puke moments, I mean, it happened in a uh, ultra marathon that I was doing that I wasn't necessarily prepared for and all the conditions went bad and I dropped from the race puking uncontrollably, like in a really bad spot. Like when it's 86 degrees out and you're throwing up and you've got the chills, not a good spot. And so I dropped from the race, but it was after about two hours, I can go in that whole story and I write about it and everything. But in that two hours, it was one of those, who are you moments? Cause you don't drop from races. Like you don't give up. And I went back and checked myself back into the race and said, man, I'm finishing this race. Like we didn't come here to paint. And that's what the rally is about. So look, we're all going to puke and the puke can be when, and that's where I think the blessing really comes into play. It's when a supervisor or a boss or a teacher or a coach tells you, you can't do it. It's going to be when that person dogs you and says, man, like you're not any good. It's going to be that moment. And those are puke moments, man, because there's nothing that feels worse than if you have somebody tells you, you can't do it. But you tell me then, why is it that everybody who's been successful, everybody was told at some point, you can't do it. That's a bad idea. Don't try it. Everybody. And then, yeah, man, there's a lot of people that were told that that didn't become successful, but only that, that moment. And the reason why I found out because that is so powerful is because it's a fish or cut bait moment. Like you cannot be on the fence when someone tells you you're not good enough. You're either going to believe that negative voice that that person says, or you're going to believe in yourself. And yeah, I can do it. There's no middle ground when it comes to that, because we all want to ride the fence. And that's becomes the part that, man, what does it take? Because if, if you're going to be in the game long enough, man, you're going to puke, you're going to have chokes, you're going to have major setbacks. And if we can realize like, look, it's not about the setback. It's always about the comeback. And then what are the skills that it takes to rally, man? Because rallying takes confidence. In order for us to have confidence, we got to have connection. It's our connection with other people that help us rally. And those people that we surround ourselves with, man, that do build us up and says, man, don't listen to that negative voice. You can do it. And those are the people that I think that we need in our lives. man. And, and that's why I really believe. And that's why I thought the, the book's been so popular and it's impacted people's lives, man. Yeah, I can't wait to, to dig deep into it. And one thing I have been checking out is you have blogs, mental toughness blogs, and they're very relevant to things that are going on. You had one about Halloween, why this Halloween was you know, so much more important than most, dealing with a lot of stuff with the pandemic. Uh, the one that really stood out to me was the top three ways to stop um, unhealthy comparisons, which I think is something that so many of us do. I've been so guilty of that pretty much for my entire life. But tell someone where they can find these blogs and then what got you started doing this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's my ADD, man. I've just felt like um, I don't write a blog just to write it. Look, if I have something to say, if I think I can help somebody, somebody can benefit from this point, you know. It, um, but my website, man, is where all that's held, man. It's just drrobbell.com. And that's the thing, thing for doing the podcast, man. It's like, how can we take somebody's message, you know, like yourselves and be able to share that story so it can help somebody else out, man. I think that's why we're here. If you'd recommend one of those blogs, somebody has time to read one of them, have a couple of minutes, which one would you say is that go-to? Man, so on my website, if they go to that blog, like which one would I want them to read? Boy, that's really tough, man. I think, <laughs> well, I'd basically say it like this. Um, if they go, I think we have to understand how the mental game works. So they got to go to the hierarchy of mental toughness because from there, that's how I lay out, hey, the, these are the mental skills that we have to have. It's not all about motivation. It's more about confidence and belief in yourself. And from that, it's more about, you know, what are you focused on? And then from that, it's how do you let go of mistakes? And, you know, one of us always struggles in that, but that's the one I recommend. Like, you got to figure out what is the skill that we're working on. It's good. People say, man, well, I want to go work out and get stronger. Well, again, that doesn't really mean anything, right? It's like, what do you want to get stronger for? Like, what's the goal there? So people need to understand, hey, what is the mental toughness about? Because they can go anywhere and find tons and tons of definitions, but which one's actually accurate? So I always say the hierarchy of mental toughness, what they got to go through. Man, there's tons of infographics there. People can just search and get lost in that stuff, man. But I appreciate, appreciate you asking that question. It's a good one. Yeah, and we'll definitely have all the information for your website yeah. uh, in the description. 
for this episode. And also speaking of your website, another thing that is, it's full of stuff, full of very, I mean, like you said, you can get lost in there. Very beneficial stuff. Talk to us about the 30 day challenge. 30 day challenge. So that was from no one gets there alone. The challenge, it's, it's something we got to do every day. And so with that 30 day challenge, what the real focus on is we have one challenge a day for ourselves. And then the next day it's challenged on how do we create a better us? So the whole focus is, is a better us makes a better you and a better you makes a better us. So yeah, we got to improve ourselves, but how are we improving other people's lives? And that gets back to the whole rally piece. How are we connecting with other people? And so like one of the goals on that challenge, man, is you got to reach out to five people every day, whether it's just pinging them, just, Hey man, I was just thinking about you, uh, man, I was just curious, you know, how's this going stuff like that. And it's from that, that you create that network. And it's, it's the beauty of we're planting trees that we're never going to see. How many people do we have on our phone right there that, I mean, there's what thousands of contacts of people that we haven't connected with in a long time. And all it is, it's going back and pinging those people and checking in because you don't know where that next lead is going to happen. You don't know where that next friendship is going to happen. Be like, oh man, Rob, I was just thinking about you. And then where that takes off, but then it's creating that, that us. And that's the part where I think it's so important is we got to create a better us. It is crazy like to think of how much impact you can have on someone just from doing that that's something i've been better at especially with the pandemic is you know instead of sitting around playing all these games on a phone i've been just reaching out to random people and you will ping people at the right time when they just need somebody to reach out and uh, it's such a rewarding feeling knowing that wow you know this was that person that they needed right then and there just by doing this and yeah um, and, that's, yeah. and that's why I say, that's why I say we plant trees that we're yeah. never going to see, you know, mm-hmm. the shade that other people are going to be able to enjoy. But that's the key. man. Yeah, you never know how much it means to them. Uh, and then there was something you talked about. You were recently on you were on Llama Lounge a couple of months back. And one of the things that you were talking about, and it really intrigued me, uh, is the balcony people when it comes to, you know, those blind spots. Explain that to, to our audience. Yeah. When we got balcony people and we got basement dwellers, right? Like, you know, I don't know many CEOs that are living in somebody's basement and I'm not saying that it's necessarily bad. I mean, we, we are in that, but like basement people want you to come down to the basement balcony. People want you to come up to the balcony and it's the balcony people that are people that are able to look down on your life and are able to speak truth into it. And that's gets back to that power of connection. And only when they can street speak, truth into it. We, we can't point out our own blind spots in life, but I think that the reason why we're here is to impact other people. And what I mean by that is I don't think we were meant to coach ourselves. If I could coach myself, man, I would, but I can't. I think we we're, I mean, the whole job is to allow other people, man, that you're going to be able to coach me up. And then who are the people that are allowing me in there to be able to coach them up? That's where I think that, you know, God's put us on this, this earth, man, to be able to connect with other people. And I don't think we were meant to live in isolation. We weren't meant to be alone and we're meant to connect with other people and everybody needs other people. And that's, that's the beauty about having those balcony people. And they're the ones too, man, that somebody tells you can't do it. They're going to point out that, yeah, you can look, here's, you've been successful here and here. Why can't you do it? Why do you think people are so afraid of feedback? Uh, the same reason why I'm afraid of it, man. I, I don't like to be pointed out that I'm not good enough and not perfect. And um, it's, uh, I, I just, you know, the ego gets involved, man. Ego doesn't want to be unemployed, you know, and the ego wants to be like, yeah, man, this is all me. I can do this stuff. When we realize that uh, not really much of it is you and it's just opportunities and helping people along the way. And that's where I think if we just focus on that, things then, um, start taking momentum and then start to manifest. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's always intriguing to me because those, the balcony people you were talking about, they can give you feedback and you can you take it and run with it. You're like, oh, okay. I'm well-respected. I absolutely, I, I'm going to value that. But the basement people, they're the ones that can tell you something and the exact same thing. And you can take it in an entirely different way. Um, even though you it need is, to hear it. Yeah. 
and this is what's interesting too, man. So it's like, if it's people that have never done something, never been an entrepreneur and they want to tell you like how to be an entrepreneur, you know, it's like really, I mean, I love this one. I heard this one from a coach, man. It's simple as this, right? Like, cause everybody has an opinion. They want to give it to you. Never take advice from somebody who would never take criticism from, you know, I'm not going to take criticism from that person because they Good. don't know me. Why am I going to take advice from that person? Yeah. And if you know, you get on there in the whole social media world too, man, if we get lost in that space, well, um, why, why are you going to listen to that criticism when you never take advice from that person? Yeah. That's a good point. So speaking of advice, what advice would you have for someone who's struggling mentally uh, through this pandemic that we've been experiencing for the past year? You know, I've alluded to it before, man. It's it's just connection, man. You got to connect with as many people as you can create that circle and create a better us. If you create a better us, it's going to help create a better you. And we weren't meant to do this on our own, but that's the biggest thing. It's what happens when, so what happens, for instance, when I struggle, I have a bad race, what do I do? Well, I lose confidence, right? Not good enough, can't do it. And then when I lose confidence, then I isolate. And it's when I isolate that the bad thoughts come in, that the demons come in, that that's when you really get attacked, right? Like the lions aren't going to be attacking the whole pack of gazelles, man. They pick that one gazelle that's going to be by themselves and they try to isolate it. If you stay connected with other people, that's what the real key is. Problem with that is a lot of times people think, well, it's just on social media and connecting with people there and likes and stuff like that. But that's, that's not the real connection. That's contaction. That's actually a term that got obsolete back in the thirties, contaction, the ability just to contact with somebody. Well, what we really need is that human connection, that human experience, man. That's what's, that's what the key is. That's what was so difficult about the pandemic, man, is it forced us to isolate, forced us to look at other people as threats, not as connections to be had. What do you think was the one thing you learned most about yourself through this pandemic? It's such a good question, man, because I, I try to reflect on this one a lot. I think the biggest thing that it showed me was that we were living it the right way. What I mean by that is my wife has always said when we got married, hey, we're going to have dinner every night. Well, everybody talked about, man, well, one of the best things were that they started having dinner together. Well, we, we always did that. So that really wasn't that different, you know. Um, also throughout our lives, every bad experience, we're trying to, we got to be able to use that as an opportunity. How is this going to be an opportunity so we can do, get better at? And, and we did that, you know, and, and I was able to help my kids with that, that shape. And it's, uh, it's an ongoing process, but I think when you need proof that you're going to be on the right path, because you even going down the path, it might not be the right path. I think that's what the pandemic personally showed for, for me and my family is that we, we are on the right path. Now you are going to get run over if you just stand there. Right. But it's like, at least you're on that right path, man, here's the direction we got to keep going in because a lot of the pandemic, it, it revealed our level of mental toughness. It revealed our level of connections and yeah, it does build it, but it only builds it through coaching and builds it through the debrief. It doesn't, you know, adversity by itself doesn't build mental toughness. It's only when, got the people that can point that stuff out or the debrief that happens after the puke that that's how like we rally from it. But that's the big thing, man, that showed is our our level of mental toughness and where we are and what are the other areas that we can keep getting better at. And you mentioned the family aspect and spending more time with the family. What is something you do or some advice you have to someone? Because I know you're, you're a parent of two. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah working on your kids, mental toughness. So it's just allowing them to take ownership about what it is that they want to do. And what I mean by ownership, you know, if you ask any coach, Hey, what kind of kid would you want? You know, what kind of kid do you want playing for your team? And they'll say, or like, Hey, what, what kind of an employer, what do they want? Cause a lot of times they think they want the star athlete, but not necessarily, man. You, what, what employers want is they want the equipment managers. They want the people that if their job if they don't do their job, then other people, you know, suffer from it. What coaches want, what college coaches want, man, is they always want those farm kids, man. Those kids that they don't care if the cows have been milked or not, man. The cows are going to get milked. You know, the cows don't care, but you're going to milk them. 
because they show up and they do it. So it's like allowing them to take ownership of what it is that they want, because once they commit to it, then we can hold them accountable to it. And it's ongoing conversations that we got to be like, look, if this is something that you want, because you said three weeks ago is something that you want. Well, then what's our level of commitment now, now that the moment of, you know, uh, excitement has worn off, but allowing them to take ownership is what's important. And that's the part that love them more than anything. You know, you want to do anything for them. But I think what we got to do is we got to build capacity for their ability to handle stuff, not dependency. I don't want my daughter when she's 24 years old and gets a flat tire out there. I don't want her first call to be to me. You know, I want her to call me later and say, Hey, this is, you know, I had a trouble and this is kind of what I did. And, you know, what'd you think, you know, but I don't want her first call coming to me because that what's, what am I doing? I'm building dependency, not capacity for her to handle those kind of situations. So that's where it's allowing them to fail and allowing them to take ownership of, of their journey. That's really good advice. Um, What's something coming up in your life that you are really looking forward to that next goal that you think you have? Big goal is this year is uh, IT 100. So it's trail 100 mile. Well, it's a 100 mile trail race. So that's going to be in the fall. It was canceled last year. So that's, what's going to be coming up this year. Man. So that's, that's the big B hack. What are you doing in preparation for that? Well, I mean, I just kind of, I'm going to put a block of training in for this month and it's just kind of working out what are the cycles of training that are going to be, because it's going to be in October and um, I'm a shiny object kind of guy. And what I mean by that is when it comes to sports, right? It's like my son loves to golf. I love to golf. Golfing doesn't necessarily prepare you for a hundred mile trail run, you know? So there has to be that, uh, that equilibrium of that and, and balance and everything. So it's, um, you know, there's litmus tests of when you're going to be ready. So like when you do back-to-back marathons, you know, Saturday and Sunday, you do a 30 mile run followed by a 20 mile run on a trail. You do that, then you're going to have the big base underneath you. Um, Cause those aren't easy days, man. But those, you know, those are, that's what it takes. And then it's just, uh, you know, getting ready for that experience and that adventure. And no doubt in my mind I'll finish, but I want to be able to enjoy those races too, you know, beyond the normal pain and, uh, you know, throw ups when those happen. You're doing some remarkable things. You're definitely making the most out of the the time that's been given to you um, on a day-to-day basis. And, you know, we've been talking about books, you know, about getting up, reading, writing, somebody goes in their Amazon cart. They already added your, your other uh, seven books that you got. They got to add that eighth what book would you recommend to somebody? There's so many different books, right? I mean, there's so many different ones. I'll tell you what, I want to answer this the right way. I'm going to throw it back on you. Just give me a context and I'll tell you which book I think would apply. Leadership. How about another one? No, I'm (laughs) I'm just kidding. Uh, I mean, when it comes to leadership, man, I mean, I, I think Extreme Ownership is a fantastic book, man. I think the analogies that, uh, Jocko Willick and, and Lee put in there. Fantastic, man. I think it's a fantastic leadership book. I highly recommend it. I'd say reading is one of those things that it, it is like a, a bottomless pit. You never can get out of it. And like I've started reading and my wife hates going to Barnes and Noble. Like my daughter, you know, she, she's been reading books like crazy and we'll take her there like on a Friday night. And I, I'm always telling my wife when we walk in, I'm like, I'm not going to grab another book. But then I go in, I'm like, oh my gosh, Atomic Habits. I've, I've been told to pick this one up. And so now I've got this huge shelf of probably like 15 books that I've not finished yet. And it's driving her absolutely crazy. But um, Curious Mind, Curious Minds, it's, it's yeah. a good thing to have. I was always told to, well, I wasn't always told, but you know, several years ago, it's like the quality of your life is going to be dependent on two things. One, the quality of relationships and the books that you read. Mm. because you've got somebody that for 25 bucks, you can buy 100% their insight that they've spent years and years collecting on how this works. I'm in man. it's 25 bucks. It's true. Kidding me? Let's go. Yeah. And what do we got to do, man? Well, you just got to read for 15 minutes every night, 30 minutes every night. Yeah. It's got, you just got to set that time aside. You got to find, man. find what works for you. And, and hence back to full circle. That's why I don't binge watch uh, yeah. TV shows, man. <laughs> 
It's a good point. Yeah, I, I'm the type that I cannot read if there is the slightest little sound. Like my dog is over here snoring right now. I probably wouldn't be able to read. But when I get up at 4 30, 5 o'clock in the morning with a cup of coffee, I feel like I'm so productive and I can just burn through some pages. Absolutely. Final question for you. Final mm-hmm. question. 50 years from now, when people mention your name, what do you want them to say about you? So 50 years from now, I want people to be able to say um, that guy helped a lot of people. And man, he, that guy got after it. You know, he wore it out. And I think he squeezed the nectar out of life. That's what I wanted to say. That's awesome. Well, sir, I definitely appreciate you taking time to join us here. One more time, if somebody wants to find out all about your books, your blogs, all the amazing things you're doing, where do they need to go to? Yeah, thanks, man. Well, I mean, on Instagram and Twitter, and my ADD always plays out there, man. It's just at Dr. Rob Bell. But my website's drrobbell.com, and, and the book is uh, pukeandrallybook.com. Awesome. Yeah. If you go to his website, you'll actually see he's got a nice little setup of all his different books that he's got. Uh, definitely encourage everyone to go out there, check them out and then check out those blogs. I got lost sitting there just reading all of the, the incredible work you have on there. So I definitely appreciate everything you're doing for mental toughness. I think that is something that is so relevant right now, probably more so than ever with uh, the change of pace of our world here with the past year. But, sir, thank you very much. That is going to conclude this episode of the Shadows Podcast.